All right, so we're going to start. So welcome everybody. Hope everyone had a great Christmas and uh, are, are in, enjoying the break between Christmas and New Year's. Uh, it's nice that everybody could jump on the call and uh, we can talk a little bit of hibiscus. It's been a while since we've all been together. So um, thought it would be fantastic for us to just touch base and see how everyone is doing. We have some Zoom questions that we're going to go through. So I think in the beginning, we're going to just have folks on mute. Um, if you have questions, feel free to uh, add them into the chat or at the end, I'll probably open it up and uh, allow folks to just chime in and, and, uh, and ask questions in an open forum. Um, but for now, we're going to just go through and make uh, introductions on a, um, for Darren and our guest of honor, Todd and, and Alex, who is uh, uh, channeling his Santa today. So uh, Darren, would you like to just do a hello and welcome introduction? Yeah. yeah. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to finally meet again after a few months. And I uh, want to hope you all had a wonderful Christmas or happy holidays, uh, or however you celebrate with your loved ones. I hope it was a good time. and, and these extraordinary circumstances, we're making our best to uh, enjoy the things, even if it's not the way we always want. Um, so we're doing fun stuff like this, and this way we can still do our hibiscus thing and have some fun. And uh, I know I was looking forward to seeing everyone. So with that, I want to first start by thanking Roxanne for doing all the moderating. She's our CIO of the society, and she does a wonderful job with all the behind the scenes tech things. Without her, we would not be able to do any of this. So Roxanne, thank you so much. We always appreciate all your efforts and you're, you're more than a professional and uh, we're just so fortunate to have you. Um, also shout out to Alex, our VP. He's always doing stuff behind the scenes and without Alex, we wouldn't be able to do half the things we do also. And we'll talk in just a second about some of the few things we got planned for this upcoming year. And so finally, I want to say and welcome. You know, our so there's some of the people, there's my name. You have it. Um... Ron, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and put you on mute. You're you're in the meeting, Ron. So oh, oh yes. I'm gonna put you on mute since uh since uh Darren is talking. Go ahead, Darren. All right, yeah. And I wanna welcome our esteemed guest for our meeting today, which is Todd Alvis from Louisiana and the Red Stick chapter of the American Hibiscus Society. Todd, we're so happy to have you here. Welcome. I would just like to add that it's it's such a special kind of uh, a gift to us to have Todd on because the last time we saw him was at the at um, at Ernie's place and so yeah. this is really a great forum because he doesn't have to have to fly out and well maybe he likes to and you know have the long vacation and go to <laughs> Disneyland and all that but you know we like that you're able to hybridize in the morning and join our call in the afternoon Todd so welcome Absolutely. and I'm so glad glad you could make it. Um, for those that don't know Todd, I'd love for you, Todd, to introduce yourself and uh, um, let everybody know your, your, your background. Um, as far as hibiscus go, I've been doing it for about eight years and I hybridize quite a bit. I've tried to get quite a few of my things out around. I think Alex has some of them now and they go around the world, but uh, it, I absolutely enjoy doing hybridizing. Uh, growing hibiscus, I have about 1,400 uh, one gallon or larger plants that I have to deal with on a daily basis. And as of right now, it's freezing outside. So everything that I do has to be kept in a greenhouse. Um, and that's basically it. What else do you need to know about me? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, having all that, that's definitely a labor of love. And uh, if, if uh, you don't already follow Todd on Facebook, you should um, find him. He has great, uh, great information, great tours of his great greenhouse, of his property, of his plants. Uh, um, he posts uh, pictures of the blooms and it's just really inspiring throughout the year. So Todd, I'm so glad you could make it today. Appreciate I will it. add one point to that. And that is that I really don't post anything personally. I do everything off of Red Stick. So you can join Red Stick. It's an open forum. So uh, that's really where I put everything at. Great. We'll follow up with an email that will have the uh, the link to that group, the Red Stick uh, group. Um, Alex, uh, care to say hello to the the crew and introduce yourself, just in case there's any folks out there that may not know who you are. Yeah, you're on mute. Muted. 
about that. Uh, hello, everybody. I think everybody already knows me, but uh, Alex Franco, uh, live in Tustin. I have a lot of hibiscus. I have uh, many of Todd's now, um, which we're trying to cross and make new ones out here and make things even better. Um, been doing hibiscus for, I don't know, Darren, five years? I can't remember when I met you. About Sounds five about years right. ago? Yeah. Yeah, about five years. Um, I just like growing things, so it doesn't matter whether it's hibiscus or anything else. And uh, <laughs> trying to head up all the the growing part side of this, which is uh, over at the nursery where we had a nice little sale last year for the group. Mm -hmm. That's me. Super. All right, great. So um, we have some questions. Um, I'll direct this to uh, our esteemed panel um, and we'll kind of go through the questions. And then for anybody that has joined the meeting, um, if you have some additional questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll be monitoring that as our meeting goes along, and then I will open it up for uh, more interactive dialogue at the end of the meeting. Um, so one of our first questions is, um, and I'm going to address this really to Darren, um, on how often should I water my hibiscus during winter? So yeah, This is a really great question, uh, especially here in Southern California where we can grow our plants outdoors. Uh, the main driver behind how much you're gonna water your hibiscus when they're outside is the temperatures. And we've noticed that anytime the temperatures dip under 50 degrees, your hibiscus plant's metabolism is going to slow down a lot. And what that means is it's not going to be uptaking nearly the same amount of water that it normally would. So if you were to continue to water your plant with the same amount of water you would do during summer or fall, um, that water is just going to, a lot of it, sit in the soil and not be absorbed by your plant. And with the cold temperatures that we get at night, that can definitely be a, a quick route to getting some root rot developing in your plant roots. Um, and of course, once that gets started, there's a lot of trouble that occurs after that. So the first thing you want to monitor is the temperatures at night. And what we recommend to do is once they start to get under 50, for every five degrees under 50 it gets, you want to reduce the amount of water by 25%. So that's going to be your guideline. And once the temperatures get down to the mid 30s or lower, we recommend at that point just to stop watering your plant completely because at that point the metabolism is so slow, it's really going to be absorbing almost nothing at that point. It's going to be almost in a dormant state by that point. Um, but again, we're lucky here in Southern California, we can keep our plants out pretty much even when it gets down to freezing. Um, what we do recommend if it's a small plant, you, you still want to take it inside because they're going to have a hard time coping with such cool weather, um, even with a rebound of a warmer day uh, the next morning. Uh, second part of that is going to be the soil. So depending, if you have your plants in the ground, the type of soil that they're growing in is going to be really important. So for example, I live in an area that's a very heavy clay soil. So that is definitely a problem for my hibiscus. So that soil just holds that water. It doesn't get much air in it, doesn't drain well, doesn't aerate. So I really have to back off on the watering of any of my hibiscus that are in the clay soil. Uh, that's why we recommend it's a good idea to, when you plant in the ground, to make a really big hole and replace whatever native soil you have with your own premium mix of soil that has lots of amendments to it to help the drainage and the oxygen levels remain in the soil all year round. The last factor, and this is one that people don't really think about, is what, what time of the day does your plant get direct sunlight in the next morning? So we've seen that people that have plants that get quick sunlight in the mornings after a cold night tend to do much better in the wintertime than plants that maybe only get afternoon sun and sit in the shade for part of the day and stay cold after a cold night. They need a quick heat rebound. So that's one thing you can do is move your plants if they're in pots to places that get that quick early morning sun hit and get the energy going fast for that plant and it helps it rebound and maintain some sort of balance with the really cold nights. So that's our answer for the uh, how much to water your hibiscus. And of course, all this great information is on our website. So we always encourage you to check that out. We put all our knowledge on there for you to get access to 24 seven. Awesome. Um, what about, uh, Darren, if, if uh, 
it, so, sometimes we get a lot of rain and it gets cold. Um, I've seen other people like cover their hibiscus from getting too wet. Would you recommend that or just to, you know, keep an eye on things? Or you put know, them in an area not, that won't get wet? That's a good strategy. Um, if you notice your plants you really are having issues with the amount of water in the soil, and let's say they're in the ground and you can't move them anywhere, uh, yeah, you could definitely cover them. They even sell a product called the Planket which um, is a good product you can use to cover your plants. That's good also for in case you have a frost or a freeze problem with where you live at too. But it's a good way to shield your plants from getting too much water. Um, I even know people, and I've done this myself, where I have potted plants and I'll take some type of covering or plastic or something and just put it towards the bottom of the pot to keep the water from going in it and just runs off the sides. So you can do little tricks like that to keep the water out if you feel like they're overwatered. Um, if you have any kind of mulch or wood chips on top of the ground, it might be a good idea to remove that during the cold months so that way it can dry out faster. Um, but on the flip side, we've also seen that a mulch or wood chips is really good if you get a heavy rain event because the, the rain hitting the ground will actually compact the soil more and that will squeeze out the air. And when the soil is wet, you don't want the air leaving it. So we found that like wood chips are a great way to stop that rain impact when it hits the ground and it keeps the soil more springy and full of air. So it kind of goes both ways. You're going to have to kind of experiment with what works for what you got and what kind of soil you're using. Oh, good, good information. Um, mm -hmm. I would uh, ask uh, Todd, I know you, you just mentioned that uh, your hibiscus are in the greenhouse. Um, during this time of year, do you actually go in and water them or you um, just kind of let them be and do they maintain all of the leaves during the winter for you? So I actually keep my greenhouse at 60 to 70 degrees all winter. And so they don't lose all of their leaves. They still lose some of them. But what I'm trying to do is get blooms so that I can hybridize. Because this is honestly the best time of the year to hybridize. Uh, the sun's not beating down on them. The pollen lasts a little bit longer. It doesn't dry out. So um, I, it still affects my watering. Uh, I, in the summer, will be up to two times a day. In the winter, when it gets really cold, so in the next month or so, I'll be switching over to uh, probably watering every other day. But I have everything on automatic watering systems. I work all the time, and so my wife said she's not watering my plants anymore, so I had to set up a, an automatic watering system. But with that, I'm able to dictate exactly how much water I want to get. Great, great. Okay, um, the next uh, next question that I have is, um, it goes along with uh, watering. Um, it, it's really the next step of uh, feeding them. Um, and should they be fed dif differently during water? I know uh, Darren mentioned about the metabolism. So um, I think I'm gonna throw this question to, to Alex and then I'm sure he's gonna defer some of the, uh, the answers also to to Darren and Todd. So Alex, what are your thoughts around feeding not just your hibiscus, but uh, um, your other plants during winter? Is there an impact to that here in the, the local area? For me, at least in Orange County, um, I leave my fertigation system on uh, because I don't just have hibiscus on that line. So I leave my fertigation system on, but literally all of December so far, I've only watered twice. And one of those was a little bit of rain. So technically I've watered really once, really heavy. Um, that has to do with a little bit with not getting all my circuits wet for Christmas and also the plants really didn't need it. Uh, the only thing that's really affected are like the bedding plants, um, which is fine because they're just cheap little dollar plants. But um, yeah, so I leave my fertilizer on myself. Um, it's warm enough. If it does get cold, um, usually rain comes at the same time and I turn my irrigation system off so then they don't get the fertilizer at that same time. Mm -hmm. For the majority of all my other plants, I usually use a slow release fertilizer in the spring that will fertilize everything all the way till fall and then it tapers out because the, there's no more heat to release that slow release. Uh, that's on my side of things. Uh -huh. So what I hear is that you ratchet back the water, which also ratchets back the, the, uh, yeah. the, the feeding of them um, yep. just by virtue of your system typically. Yep. Um, Darren, uh, your thoughts on feeding them during the winter? Yeah, Alex brought up great points. Um, what's really interesting we've had noticed here is during the winter time, if you continue to feed your hibiscus, the normal fertilizers you do, and they're not uptaking the water as much, 
then those fertilizers in that water remain in your soil and they start to build up. And what can happen over time is you'll actually get too much fertilizer in your soil. And when the plant's metabolism starts to speed up again in spring when the temperatures rise, the soil's got way too much fertilizer in it and you start to get fertilizer burn. So it really is important that you watch that metabolism rate and the temperatures and you gauge the amount of water and fertilizer that goes into that soil because later on you could definitely pay a price on that. And the other thing I would also bring up too is that you have to remember hibiscus hate change. And when the weather gets cold at night, they don't like that. They want to be 88 in Hawaii every day. So they're already not happy with the colder temperatures and seasonal weather conditions, which is what they're not built for. But then when you add in a change of the inputs like the water and the fertilizer, they'll like that even less. So you have to remember you're kind of giving them a, a negative double whammy. So you got to really be gentle with them and keep in mind that they're just going to be unhappy. And when they have the really slow metabolism, that means that when they start to rebound in the spring, that rebound takes longer than it would in the summertime because they're not at regular metabolism. So what might take two weeks to show an effect and get past might take three or four weeks or even longer um, in the late part of winter. That's a that's great great advice because I know you you do talk about um, if you see if you see your hibiscus you got to think about what happened to it two weeks prior and uh, having it you know take longer because of the slow ramp up of metabolism is a mm -hmm. is a great point. Um, Todd, on as far as uh, your hibiscus, I, I think that if I were ever to be reincarnated as a hibiscus, I'd probably want to just be you know in the greenhouse. So they're <laughs> they're living it up. Um, uh, do you change the their, the fertilization pattern for them in the winter? I actually don't um, because like I said, I keep everything 60 to 70 degrees inside of the greenhouse. And here's an important thing for you to know about. Um, slow release uh, fertilizers, like you talked about, the plants actually cannot metabolize that until it hits 70 degrees. So if you're having a number of days where you're never hitting 70 degrees, like Darren said, that stuff is sitting in the soil and it can form salts if you build up too much in there and, and it can really be detrimental to your plants. That's the reason that I keep my greenhouses at 60 to 70 degrees, uh, 60 to 70 degrees. So in the daytime, they're still gonna get up in the upper 80s, 90s sometimes. So I know that I'm staying in that range so I can continue to fertilize. If you don't have them in a greenhouse in my environment, do not fertilize, especially don't use slow release um, on them at this point. Great, great point. Um, would you change, would any of you change the type of fertilizer? Because I know with other plants, uh, you know, you, you like orchids, they, certain parts of the year, you have to change the type of fertilizer. For hibiscus, is it just basically the, the same kind of fertilizer throughout the year if you were to fertilize? Yeah, I, I think you can keep it pretty much the same. Like for instance, if you get the Hidden Valley special blend fertilizer and you're also using their booster, then probably during the winter time, you could stop using the booster and just go with the special blend, which is like your main fertilizer ingredient. So what I'd say is maybe when you're using extra things to boost your hibiscus, that would be during the warmer times of the year. And then during the colder times, stick with just one thing that's more straight and direct and you're not gonna worry as much about getting that fertilizer build up. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Um, Good, good discussion. Um, I think those are really good questions, especially for those of us that are watching our hibiscus as they start to wind down in the in the winter time. Um, what about as they're winding down? There's a lot of pruning going on. I know people are cutting trees and cutting back bushes. What about uh, hibiscus? How do they react to uh, getting pruned uh, now? Can we do that, Darren? You know, we're so lucky living here in Southern California with our dry mild climate that unless there's a rain event going on, we can pretty much prune any time of the year. We're one of the few places that you can do that. So yeah, we can pretty much prune anytime. I tend to recommend that we do it right before that first spring growth spurt we're going to get, which tends to usually be sometime in February, late February is when we typically see it. Although this year with La Nina, happening that might actually occur a little bit earlier because it didn't seem like we're getting much in the way of rain events and the weather 
highs every day been somewhere in the 70s so it's been pretty ideal so this is one of those years where you can you know, whereas like last year when we had a lot of rain all the way into april we were stuck until pretty much almost beginning of may before we were able to really do that pruning for the spring growth spurts because we didn't really see any growth spurts last year until like almost the end of may which is really really late for us um, but if you live in other areas where you got higher humidity that pruning of your plant is like an open wound on it and You'd be amazed if it's warmer temperatures how quickly that can get infected and you get dry rot going on before you know it so again we're really fortunate here in, in southern california we can be kind of disregard that for the most part unless there's a rain event great great um todd what are your thoughts i know since you're kind of focusing on hybridizing do you just keep letting them grow because you want them to produce buds or do you take a hit at like like oh, i'm just going to cut this one back and if you do cut it back like what is your recommended percentage of cutting back so i do actually just let them grow um for the most part and if anybody's seen my greenhouse they are packed in my greenhouse so i actually grow up instead of out uh there's no space in between my my uh my plants but i do trim them quite a bit to make copies of them that's about the only reason that i will do it or if they're starting to hang over into the walkways then i'll cut them up and and i will uh root cuttings and give them away to some of our members and, and stuff like that but uh for us in this area now is a horrible time to do pruning because if you don't have a greenhouse this those plants are are already struggling to survive and you're just giving them something else that they've got to worry about uh, you really want to wait until later in the spring to cut in this area and i would imagine northern parts of california would probably be the same way mm -hmm. um so i i still do it but i have a greenhouse and so it you know doesn't affect me as much all right all right good good information um what about uh, you know protecting them from the the weather you know in transitioning okay watering and their metabolism slowing down and the temperatures um, getting colder um, can we bring them inside during winter and I'm gonna I'm gonna start with Todd on this question and then uh, we'll we'll move over to Alex and Darren um, Todd you you have them all in your greenhouse do you ever bring them inside the house too? I don't bring them inside the house. I did them inside of my garage one year, actually the year that I built my smaller greenhouse, uh, just trying to protect them. And I did really good, except that I had them all on a concrete floor and the floor was even getting cold and I started to lose them after about a month and a half of doing that. When it got really cold, uh, I started losing certain ones of them so you can absolutely bring them inside that was the reason that I, I built a greenhouse if you watch some of my pictures during the summer the greenhouses get too hot and so i actually strip almost everything out of the greenhouses so it's basically the same as bringing them inside of my house at the temperatures they're at right now mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it makes sense um alex darren what are your thoughts on bringing uh the potted plants uh inside during during winter uh, i personally think that it's doable um, as long as your temperatures stay consistent uh, that they don't have any type of draft or heat or AC blowing on them uh, but the in, the fun thing about the inside you will have usually a little bit more insect activity because of the still air like um, spider mites uh, white fly you'll get a little bit more of that action going on so that's the only reason I wouldn't bring them inside but at the same time, we all follow the same people that are in Russia growing them inside their apartments. So, um, yeah, you could grow them inside. There's just a little more work to that. I don't, I don't know who those, the, the, the Russian people that you guys follow, but uh, I'll have to look. <laughs> <laughs> Darren, your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, my experience is if you're growing the plants outside in pots, um, and once those temps again get under 50 degrees at night, uh, the, the young ones, those small ones, even if one has been around for a few years, but if they're small and they're not that big of a plant, um, they're gonna struggle with those nighttime lows. And kind of what Todd was saying, when the pots get really cold because of the ground they're on and the root systems start to get cold, the soil stays cold all day and night, that is really tough for the hibiscus because they're not genetically bred for those kind of conditions. So 
The second you see any kind of wilting or floppy leaves going on or any kind of branch dieback on a smaller young plant, that's your cue to get it to a place where it gets warmth 24 hours a day. And uh, like on our website, we have a couple great examples of how you can even get like a little plant rack that's enclosed in like a plastic zipper cover and you can put some type of heating element inside of there just to try to perk up those plants. And you'd be amazed what a difference that makes with them. Um, so it's a little bit of a work and space is a consideration that you have to take into account so you have a place to put them. Um, if you don't, just even putting them in some place at night where they have some type of coverage over them or protection, um, that can sometimes be enough to get them to start to go in the right direction again. And uh, Todd brought up another good point too. He says he doesn't cut his plants too much because he needs the space. And if you are space constrained, then when it comes to pruning your hibiscus, you might want to think about making them more vertical so you have more room to pack them in together. And one other strategy I've seen people use that's been kind of successful is if you don't have the ability to bring them inside, put the plants really close together. The closer they are to each other, the more branches and leaves touching each other, the more they kind of insulate each other from the colder temperatures. And you'd be surprised how much that can help out too. Any kind of tree or something above them can definitely help insulate them a little bit too. Uh, so those are all little strategies that can help make differences, um, keeping them going. Those are great tips, really great tips. All right, um, so I think uh, we, we did talk about watering and uh, in, in Southern California, we our rain can be a little unpredictable. I know you mentioned uh, La Nina, um, and uh, you know, when, when it rains, are, are do we need to worry about them getting over watered if, uh, if you know, we have big storms that come through. Um, Darren, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, so that's a really interesting question because you would naturally think, you know, rainwater is going to definitely be a problem if you already got that perfect balance for your potted hibiscus or in-ground hibiscus. But we've done some exper experiments over the years where we've actually turned off of our fertilizer or fertigation systems and just let them get rainwater during some stretches where we had some rainy three or four weeks. And if it's not really heavy rain, they actually love the rainwater. And our thinking behind this is, is the rainwater is actually oxygenated more than regular water as it falls through the atmosphere to the ground. And they tend to seem to really like that extra oxygen. We know the hibiscus roots like a lot of air in the soil. So maybe that helps deliver a little bit more of that to the soil. And we've noticed not only do they perk up when they get the rain, but rain is great too, because one thing you never think about is, especially here in dry Southern California, is if we don't get rain for seven, eight months straight, your hibiscus can get a huge buildup of debris on the leaves. And the rain is a great mechanism to clean off those leaves and clean up the plants, and they can breathe a lot better and photosynthesize a little bit better too. So that isn't, that the rain really helps with as well. We actually recommend that maybe if we have a long stretch like we've just had now, we've had no rain now for God how many months, um, wash off your plants. If you can not get the soil too wet, it really helps them out. And not just your hibiscus, anything you're growing could probably enjoy the fact that you can get all that dust and debris because we get those Santa Ana wind events blowing and boy, that dust really and dirt starts to build up on all the plants and it, they don't like that. So it, it's a win-win when you can get that rain and just got to watch, make sure it's not too much. Uh, a good point, Darren, because we had those fires and we had a lot of ash drop kind oh, of locally. Horrible. So, um, you know, having them be be kind of rinsed off so that they can uh, breathe um, is probably really helpful. Um, Alex, uh, I know that you set up a, a big uh, sprinkler system from on top of your house to make it look like it was raining in Hawaii. Uh, do you use that at all during the uh, winter or do you use that to wash your plants off? No, I only use that in the summer. Uh, that's that's actually isolated on my phone in the wintertime, so it doesn't do overhead in the winter. Uh, because the chilling temperatures at night, um, I don't want to overhead water anything outside. Mm -hmm. Except right. on warm days. But You don't yeah, want to fake them into thinking it's raining. I only do that from spring to fall. <laughs> that's it. All right. Great. If, if, if uh, any of you have not seen Alex's backyard um, Hawaiian rain video, uh, you're missing out. So make sure you uh, hit him up to, to be able to see that video. It's, it's, takes you right, right to Hawaii. It's pretty, 
pretty great. great. Um, some of the other questions that I have. So I noticed that uh, one of my hibiscus flowers actually had a seed pod and it had seeds in it. So I think I'm going to ask this question to Todd and, uh, and then uh, probably lob it to Darren. Um, so with seeds, is it okay to, um, to just start the seeds at any time of the year? What are your thoughts around that, Todd? So what I've found in growing seeds is you do not want to go above 85 degrees or below 65 degrees when you're trying to germinate them. They, above 85, if you get past 90, 95, I mean, you can get down to 10% of your plants germinating. It's, it really starts wiping them out really quickly. And unfortunately, I found that out the hard way with some of Dick Johnson's uh, seeds. So, oh well, that happened. But uh, also getting cold is gonna be an issue. Too much wind uh, in there fluctuating those temperatures. I actually have a, a pretty nice environment set up for mine and I'm somewhere in the 90% germination rate. With that, uh, I've posted plenty of videos and, and uh, pictures and how to's on, on how I do it. Uh, but it's been pretty successful the, the way I do it, so. Great, great. Um, Darren, what about, uh, well, Darren and, and Alex, I, I know you guys uh, do a, a lot of, uh, you know, starting from seed. Uh, what are your thoughts around starting seed in California this time of year? Go ahead, Darren. <laughs> I think, um, it, like Todd said, it all comes down to you have to have very stable temperatures and humidity um, when you're going to be germinating seeds and that kind of goes for anything like rooting or grafting it's it's got to be ideal hibiscus conditions all day all night 24 7 so that is the first thing you got to figure out before you even start how are you going to create those conditions so that's number one uh, number two thing is when you get a seed pot on your hibiscus their seeds are not going to be viable unless someone actually physically did pollination so some, for some new, new folks, they might think they have seeds, but really if you just let the uh, petals fall off and you've got the remaining seed pod developing, but no one ever pollinated, those seeds are probably not going to be viable. So you got to remember that you got to cross them yourself and cross pollinate to get seeds that are viable. Um, other than that, I think the other mistake I see people make when it comes to seed germination is they tend to overwater the soil and those seeds get mushy real quick. So you just want to keep the soil moist, but you don't want to make it super wet like you have a plant growing in there. And you just got to be patient and with the right conditions um, that they will germinate for the most part. Uh, another thing, because our weather here is so dry, um, it's probably really important that you have some type of cover over your seed tray or whatever you're growing your seeds in to keep the humidity in. Because all it takes is just one day of it drying out and they're not going to be happy. You could lose a lot of your baby plants or seeds. Mm -hmm. I have one of those uh, harvest uh, machines that's, uh, you know, you can grow herbs in it. Could I, could I germinate uh, my hibiscus? Has anybody ever done the, uh, you know, hydroponic uh, propagation with seeds? No? All right. I have that's a, that'd be fun to try, though. You, I've not. I've done plumeria, so I'm sure hibiscus would be fine, too. Mm-hmm. Um, and it works because there's still the water is oxygenated, right? So it gets a little bit of the air through it versus yep. okay all right great um so um does uh i i want to go on to uh what's what's coming up next you know it's like we've covered a lot of uh you know what what we do to to take care of our, our hibiscus this time of year um and uh, these meetings are, I, I think it's really nice to see everybody and start talking hibiscus. So really, really glad we had the opportunity to do that. What do we have to, to look forward to? And I um, ask uh, Darren and Alex, uh, hey, what do you guys have in store for us? Alex, tell them all about our wonderful new plants coming. Um, yeah, so it looks like so far, uh, Darren, you could fill me in on the names because I kind of forget right now, you know, COVID brain. Uh, but uh, it seems, seems like uh, we got about, about 150, 200 in one gallons already. So it looks like we'll have a pretty decent percentage coming in the spring for our spring sales slash membership stuff. Um, so some of the varieties though are pretty, some pretty nice varieties. 
Um, I do have that one that's named for George Crochet. Uh, some of those did germinate, I know that, and I named it um, Hot George, just like his plumeria. Um, uh, and then, Darren, what other varieties do you have that are pretty cool that are coming up? I forget the varieties that we took. Well, one that I'm really excited about is Morant Imperial Blossom. That's a really pretty, like, five-tone one that yeah. is hard to find for sale anywhere. Uh, we got quite a few uh, Tahitian crosses from Dick Johnson that have never been sold before. A lot of purples and pinks and, and violet color ones with multiple bands. So we're excited about getting those out too. Um, so we got, so basically like last year, we're gonna have a lot of varieties you've never seen for sale before, which is gonna be fantastic. So uh, yeah, a lot, lot of new things that no one else is gonna be able to have. So uh, save up now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there will be another another sale. That's that's exciting news. Um, Todd, uh, as far as uh, upcoming events, are you gonna uh, are you planning to come visit us soon? <laughs> Actually, trying to go out to Hawaii next year. So we were planning on it this year, couldn't do it, but uh, I'm sure I'll be out to California in the next year or two. Well, you're Something always like welcome. That. You're always welcome here, and I know uh, you know it's always good to see you and your family. So let us know anytime. Um, as far as uh, besides plant sales, any any thoughts around when we might have a, another meeting? Yeah, good, good reminder there, Darren. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, um, so with everything going on with COVID right now, I don't think we're going to see any possible way of having an actual meeting until maybe sometime in the summer, depending on how quickly the vaccinations start to really turn things around. So I think in the meantime, we'll probably have two or three more uh, Zoom meetings. If, if we get really good attendance, maybe we'll do it once a month, kind of like we did the meetings. Um, so that's something we can definitely do. But I know that we're all dying to go out and see things in person again. So uh, we'll just have to keep tabs on stuff, but maybe summer will be our next uh, chance to see where things are at and try an actual meeting, which would be great. I, I wish I could do a meeting right now. I got booms all over the place. So if with this La Nina weather, it's been ideal and the, the hibiscus are not slowing down at all. The booms aren't as exciting, but who cares, right? The hummingbirds like them. <laughs> yeah. You know, things blooming right now is just always, it's always good. It's always yeah. good and festive, especially right now. Um, all right. So, uh, Darren, what did you just highlight? I, I saw something flash across the street, screen. Yeah. So, uh, let's kind of show you real quickly what's, what's blooming today. I just pick these like literally like about 10 minutes before the meeting. So this is catharsis doing its beautiful multi-banded colors. Wait, where'd it go? It was in there. There it is. There it is. All right. So we got catharsis. Size is a little bit smaller, but that's what happens in winter. So I don't know if you guys can see this. I'm going to bring it up close. There we go. Do you notice there's something missing at the end of the pistol there? Yeah, there's the, no pads. Yeah. This no is pads. common that happens with the colder temperatures, especially when you get under 50 degrees. They, it's kind of like the, they know it's not the right time of year to be trying to reproduce because the conditions are pretty bad and they probably wouldn't make the best chances of uh, cross pollinating successfully. So the plants actually either stop growing the pads or in this case here, it's actually underneath. Pretty cool. So you, you're going to see that a lot during winter time, where they just lose the pads or they hide them down low because they don't they, they don't really want to be pollinating. Wow, so, that's like a magic trick. Yeah, pretty interesting, huh? So you'll see yeah. that. In fact, I'd say about 95% of my booms right now don't have the pads out at the front anymore. So, but just typical. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so that was uh, catharsis. That was catharsis. Here's Cindy's heart doing her usual thing. Nice big fat bloom. There we go. And about how big is that that bloom across? And this one's pretty big. This is getting close to eight inches. Wow. So now this is probably the, off of the sunniest spot of my property. So it's going to do pretty dang well all year round. So that's good. Here's one of my favorites, sculpted. Mm -hmm. right, there it is. Nice roughly bloom. Nice inky blue. This is. Moonlight Sonata, there we go. Yeah, as long as you keep it in front of your face, it recognizes it as. Yes, 
Yeah. We're not, there. we're not confusing technology. All right. <laughs> Here's another fun one I like. It's called Spice Island. And you can see in the winter, uh, summertime, it's really a splashy with gold and yellow and orange all over it. But cooler temperatures, it goes back to being predominantly just like a more red color, which you see that for a lot of your blooms. And in honor of the season, I have Rudolph making his magical appearance. He's tired because he just worked very hard a couple nights ago for Santa. So he, he needs a rest, but he's still doing his thing. So go Rudolph, we love you. This is another one I love. It's called Donna Lynn. It's an oldie but goodie wow. from Barry Schluter. And oh, by the way, this one's going to be for sale in our spring sale. This is one of the plants we're working on growing. So really pretty big bloom. This is a seven to eight inch bloom. Lots of bands, very pretty colors. Darren, and that, that one's name is again? Donna Lynn. Donna Lynn. Yeah, write it down. It's a good one. This one is called Cinnamon Spice by Dick Johnson of Tahiti. Uh, in the summertime, it's all splashes of yellow. But of course, in the wintertime, it goes back to just more of a one color. But it's still really pretty bloom. And here's one of my favorites. Nefertiti. Yeah. That's a nice one. It's a red and purple semi-double Hidden Valley. We're trying to get, it's a slow growing plant. We're trying to get cuttings off this to propagate it at some point. So I'm hoping come spring, we can finally get our first cuttings off this guy. And this might be one we'll do for the sale uh, next round. So hopefully that will be the case. And finally, another one of my favorites, Bohemian Rhapsody. This is a really pretty one that gets all kinds of white splashing and more magenta in it during the summer. So this is another really nice one. That one looks very different in the winter, actually, I would say. The Bohemian? Yeah. 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 Very different. So they tone down, but you know, mm -hmm. different looks. Still, still, still glad they're blooming. Mm -hmm. So now that I've seen my hibiscus, I need to go into hibiscus extra mode. So, okay. <laughs> very nice. Right. Um, yes. We have a, also just a reminder, um, Hidden Valley is going to be having their sale, right, Darren? Yes, December 30th, they will be reopening up the store with their new inventory for spring shipping. So check them out December 30th. You should get an email that day when the store is open. Um, and they'll have their biggest variety of hibiscus for sale then. So something to get excited about. And for us hibiscus junkies, that's really the day of Christmas for us. Yeah, you have to you have to be online when they're when they're opening, right? It's gets a little uh, yeah competitive. There's some there's, some, there's uh, some plants that might sell out within minutes. So yeah, excellent, uh, Alex. Uh, any anything to add? Any uh... Uh, nothing on my end. I just uh, wanted to see, and I don't. I also don't know uh, who's in the actual chat because there's no pictures on the other side. But uh, Todd, if you ever have any. Uh, open houses that you do for your red stick community um, if you want to let them know when you normally have it if it's not a COVID year because I know you have hundreds of people normally through your through your place to give give out plants I'd like you to at least um, let them know when that normally is um, I know this year is going to be kind of up in the air but I figured you should at least let people know if they're in the Louisiana area Yeah, I actually do it after the last show of the season and before we go to convention. So that's usually in uh, June, like mid-June, something like that. So I got to get rid of a good bit of plants before I leave for a week or so to go to convention. So that's when I typically knock it out. So we should be planning a big road trip. Is that like with big trucks and stuff? <laughs> I was about to say big trucks because a lot of those plants are 10, 12 feet tall. So uh, wow. it's not uncommon to have people cut them in half as soon as they get them. So. Wow. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, um, so we're at the uh, 1145 mark. I'd like to open it up for some uh, general questions or, you know, if you want to ring in and say hello. Um, all of our other members uh, that were not part of the panelists are on mute. So if you'd like to say hi, I see Norm, you're going off of mute. Um, please unmute and uh, you can say hello and um, ask any questions. So we just like to open it up to an open forum now. I have a question for Todd or Darren or Alex. 
Has there been much uh, hybridizing toward variegated leaves with hibiscus? I can actually answer that. Um, DuPont came out with a plant that was a painted sky. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with painted sky. It's something that's really big in this area. Um, but it's a really nice bloom. They actually came out with variegated leaves on it, on a sport of it. The bloom is a little bit smaller than painted sky. And I actually unofficially, don't tell anybody, I actually have one of those plants and I've been trying to propagate with it. The problem is what I'm finding is with the variegation, it's almost like the leaves are not able to get all of the, I, I guess they don't have the chlorophyll in there. And so the, it's kind of a weak plant overall. Um, and, and that seems to be all of them. They're just, it's not a fast grower. Honestly, I really like the idea of the, the variegated, but um, I don't know. The, the plant well, itself is not doing anything for me. Has there any I can, work in I can on other that species of hibiscus that have variegations to try and integrate the pollen into these hibiscus, the big blooms you have? So the, uh, like a Snow Queen is one that is variegated a lot of times. I've tried to get some crosses with that. I've not been very successful in getting crosses with Snow Queen uh, to be able to come out with anything. I did have one a few years ago that I made a cross with, but honestly, every single bloom that came out of it was exactly the same. The leaf structure was the same. The growth patterns were the same. I had uh, 40 something of them that came out of the seed pod. I kept six of the, the seeds and grew them all out side by side. You could not tell one from the other. They were identical. They all bloomed with just a flat red that looked like Snow Queen. Nothing special. None of them ended up variegated. My thought is that it went, it somehow went back to its original species and, and just replicated itself. And everybody that I talked to that grew out their seed got exactly the same thing from it. So I've tried. I'm working on it. You, you know, with Clivias, it's the maternal uh, that carries the variegation in it. So, uh, you know, if you pollinate two variegates, you're going to get a variegated. If, if you take, uh, a, let, let's say, female variegation pollen and put it on a male unvariegated, you'll get 100% non-variegated. So I don't know if there's any crossover with hibiscus like that either. I do not know. I know hibiscus tiliaceus is another one that has a, I mean, it's really tons of variegation in that. And they've got the red and the white in it. Uh, but those don't cross over to to the the kind that we're the exotic hibiscus that we're doing things with. So I, I haven't been able to get. It. I'm definitely trying because I would love to see it. I got harassed so much when I showed people the seeds that I got off of Snow Queen, just saying, "Oh God, I gotta have them, whatever it costs." I'm like, "Man, I'm not selling these things." So maybe it's something I need to start experimenting with. <laughs> I, I definitely would, and if you came out with something, I'm sure you could make a ton of money selling it because everybody wants it. I'm going to jump over to um, Alex right now because I know he's anxious to show what he's got. He's been waving it around, and uh, oh, no, I'm being... just trying to get to back to my reception. That's all. Um, so this is actually a variegated variety. It has a pink flower, um, Todd. I'm sure you're uh, well aware of it, but this is from Logies. I got it as a small, really small plant but I put it against a brown background so you could see the variegation in it. And the, the flower that they show on this is actually a medium size exotic pink. Now, I don't know what variety it is. Todd, you might know. I um, don't know but it. You do? I do not. Yeah, so I'm trying to grow this out. It's going in the ground in the spring um, to, there, there you can see it. Because the foliage is very well variegated. It's not any type of mutation or um, iron deficiency or anything like that. So they're calling, they're literally just calling it variegated pink hibiscus. And the picture that they showed on it was actually a medium sized pink multi tone bloom. So as soon as I get a bloom on it, uh, uh, you, got, you guys will be the first to know. Great. That's what? a great question, Norm. I know variegated uh, foliage is such a hot thing right now. So great, great question. And it's interesting to hear on Clivia that, it, you know, the, the mother carries the, the, uh, the gene. Um, what other questions do we have out there? 
while we're waiting, can I interject one last thing on that variegated? Uh, oh yeah, leaf sorry, leaf? Darren. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, um, Todd brought up a really good point that when the leaves are variegated, you do have less chlorophyll in the leaves, so they can't photosynthesize as much. Um, we see the same issue with some of the new varieties that have the lobed leaves, where the surface area is not nearly as much as a regular leaf hibiscus. And again, you have less chlorophyll too, and those plants always tend to be not as vigorous and hardy as some of the regular varieties of hibiscus. And then the mention of tillaceous is a good one too, because that one's super variegated, but if you've ever seen a tillaceous that's fully growing, the leaves are absolutely huge. So it's kind of like nature kind of figured out that there's not as much chlorophyll. So because of that, we'll make much bigger leaves. So we have much bigger surface area and then the plant can still be strong and do its thing. So those are interesting growth aspects to the variegation uh, or surface area that you might not have as much chlorophyll in them. It's a, definitely a factor. Fantastic. All right, great. I have another comment on fertilizers. And I probably do something a lot of people on here don't do, and that's I fertilize all year long, except I do change my fertilizer in the winter. I go to a zero nitrogen and to about a 30-30 phosphorus potassium only on my plants to uh, go to more of a root uh, cold tolerance and root hardiness on my plants. Makes sense. Yep. Great. Thanks, Norm. Other other questions from the, the crew or just uh, updates that you guys have? How are your plants doing? Have you had any uh, losses this year so far with the weather? I know for our yard, it's been, you know, highs in 80s one day and the the, the lows are in the 40s. So it's, you know, definitely that Southern California swing in temperatures that we're experiencing here. Yeah, La Nina should really help out a lot of you growers with your high biscuits. It's been a mild winter so far, so you should be still seeing some blooms and they should still be growing even if it's a slower rate. So we've had a, pretty much opposite of last winter. It's been very nice. You know, those one gallons I bought at the sale, they're still blooming. They're not very big, but they still produce one or two blooms on them. Love to hear that. Wow. That's great. All right. Well, if there's no um, other questions, I think, I think we, can... we have a question. All right. Hello. Hi, Bob. Uh, uh, the one gallon pots that I got it to, from you guys, uh, they've tripled in size since I've got them and put them in and they're blooming like crazy. Uh, in the cold weather, like yes, some of the colors uh, die back, the, uh, the flames, the red and the yellows. But I, I only use uh, comfrey. I have that plant and I make uh, tea out of it. And, and that's all I use on all my stuff. And uh, I just wanted to say that the tripling in size, uh, I'm really excited about it. Wow. Wow, that's great news, Bob. I hear that comf comfrey tea, that, that tea gets pretty, um, pretty smelly once you've uh, like brewed it. Is that true? Uh, you just cut it, cut it back, uh, keep a lid on it, and uh, you know, cut it like a fifty percent. Uh, put water in it. Oh, they must love that. Yeah, you know that actually brings up a, a good point. When you grow your exotic hibiscus, you're going to find that the big driver behind your happiness and growth is always going to be heat energy. So unless you feed them way off or you have the soil conditions way wrong, if you got the right heat going on and humidity, they're usually gonna do pretty well. And, and I think that's what you're gonna find. And that's where they struggle the most in winter is that lack of heat energy. Hmm. Great. Other questions? All right. What, what was that? You wanna know where I got these great glasses from oh yeah party city you'd be surprised they got some pretty cool luau tiki slash hibiscus stuff i highly recommend if you can sneak in there it's well, well worth it i'm going to be going back and binge spending soon so good stuff thank you for the shopping tip darren appreciate it
make sure uh, make sure after you uh, you know do your hidden belly uh, cl clicking uh, you know the next morning you can head out to Party City and stock up. After will I do we, my 12 step be, program with Alex, I will. Will we be um, stocking those in our uh, you know our uh, meetings? When will they kick back up? Maybe we need to buy a case and you know. I think I think the hibiscus lifestyle needs to happen. Yes, for sure. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, well, thank you so much for, for joining the meeting. We really appreciate everybody's attendance and great questions, great conversation. Todd, thanks for, for being kind of our um, guest of honor and um, virtually spending this time with us. Um, and uh, we will have this recording posted. So if uh, any of you missed it or if you know folks that wanted to see it, um, you know, just let them know that we'll have the re recording so they don't have to feel like they missed out on seeing Darren with his hat and glasses um, as one of the high points. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, uh, happy holidays. Um, happy New Year. Um, please be safe out there. And we'd love to hear from you as far as uh, additional meetings and topics and guests. Great job, Say bye now. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Happy holidays.